December 1st, commencement of winter, and no prospect of winter quarters. What an endless amount of misery and suffering this winter will bring forth. God grant us a mild season, for so many of our troops are without proper clothing. We meet a great many wagons bringing away the women and children from Fredericksburg, as a battle is imminent in that neighborhood, and the Yankees have threatened to shell the city. Camped in a fine wood, five miles from Fredericksburg. It is thought we will leave here in a day or so, as Lee only wanted Jackson to join him, and then he would fall back near Richmond, providing the Yankees flanked him in crossing the Rappahannock. Should Mr. Yank attempt to cross the river and give Lee the hill advantage, somebody's going to get hurt. Tis my impression the Yankees will attack Richmond from the south side of the James, and thus force us to evacuate Fredericksburg. It makes not the least difference which route they take, for Lee and his never-whipped army will certainly be a heavy obstacle in their way, and one that will not easily be overcome. The Yankees are a most tenacious race, and they will try every scheme before giving up their point. December 6th. Snowed and rained all day, bitterly cold at night. We build big fires and keep warm as best we can. We have no tents, and our tarpaulins are perfectly open to the cold, cold wintry wind. December 8th. I carried a deserter from our regiment to General Jackson's headquarters at Guinea's Depot, and there delivered him to the provost marshal. I doubt exceedingly if he intended to desert, but he is a poor, ignorant man, and is very likely to be shot. His name is John Edwards of Spotsylvania County. December 9th. Last night was the first time I slept in a bed for many months, and really it gave me a sore throat. Oh, the luxury of a feather bed, especially on a cold winter's night. Think of it. Ye discontented citizen who grumble at every little inconvenience, yes, think of how it gladdens the heart and warms the bones of the poor soldier who manages to sleep in a comfortable bed once in twelve months, whilst you are rolling and sweltering in the pampered lap of affluence, and how often is that affluence ground out in the pitiful wages of the half-clothed, half-fed, and not at all remunerated private soldier who has given up all to fight your battles, to risk his life for you. Will it be remembered when the halcyon days of peace shall come back to our fair land once more? Will it be remembered when the soldier wants place, work, position? Or will you forget it all and give honor and trust and position to the stranger, or worse still, to the skulker, the dodger, and the deserter? Ah, remember that oftentimes you have turned with disgust and contempt upon your countenances from the ragged and ill-fed soldier, though perhaps the soldier's heart was as pure as the driven snow, though he was the hero of twenty bloody battles. Yes, you turn from him in disgust and welcome the brass-buttoned and the gold-laced officer though he secured that office by unjust means and promises never intended to be fulfilled. Often that poor private has left behind him, far away, in his once happy home, a fond wife and doting children, who are now suffering for the common necessities of life, whilst you, never having done anything for your country, save once when you furnished a substitute, and he is in run off long ago, Yes, you are making your untold thousands by oppressing that soldier's family, by making them pay a hundredfold advance upon the very salt that goes into their daily bread. December 12th. Fredericksburg has been evacuated by our troops. The enemy have crossed the Rappahannock, and tomorrow's sun will set on a field bathed in human blood. This has been a day of more vexation to me than any other of the war. First of all, we commenced yesterday evening by receiving orders to put up baggage and hold ourselves in readiness to move at a moment's notice. However, we were not disturbed until four o'clock this morning when we were ordered to pack up and leave immediately. Hardly had we gotten into the road when we were ordered back, as our first orders were countermanded. 
After remaining in camp a few hours, we were again ordered to move. Taking the river road towards Fredericksburg, we marched five or six miles and again halted. We prepared to cook two days' rations as we camped. Just as we had gotten fully into the merits of roasting beef and baking suspicious-looking bread, we were again ordered to take to the road. So we pitched our hot ovens into the wagons, rolled up our blankets, struck tents, and once more resumed our march. Brigade after brigade pushed rapidly, my, at a double quick, for Jackson must be at Fredericksburg early tomorrow morning, or the day is lost. And when the old blue light says, he'll be thar, you may look for him. The roads were narrow, steep and rugged. For a time we were mixed up in dire confusion, and, to crown all, our battery got separated, some of the guns taking one road and some another. Then, to mix up matters worse in counter-marching, we ran into another battery, broke a sponge staff for them, and they had to unlimber their guns for us to get by. On regaining the road, our infantry were massed so densely that we were compelled to remain in the field until some sort of order could be restored out of the chaotic confusion into which we were thrown. Indeed, it was most cheering to mark the splendid spirits in which our troops seemed infused. Here an army, ill-fed, ill-clothed, and worse paid, is rushing with a sort of frenzied delight towards what must be a terrible battlefield. The wild shout of the careless, reckless, but daring soldier as he hurries on to meet the foeman, never heeding the fact that he has eaten nothing the livelong day, nor that his feet are bare, nor that by tomorrow's eve he may be a mangled corpse, but looking only to his duty, little recks he of the future." Now our artillery is waiting orders to move, and night has thrown her sable mantle over us. Tomorrow will be a day filled with bloody deeds, and many of us will never know its issue. God grant it may be a day of success. Hurry up with the artillery. Such are the orders now, and it means business. The creaking of the ponderous wheels in our advance and the shouts of the excited drivers as they lash their jaded horses into feats of powerful pulling, bespeak, bespeak the earnestness of the midnight march. We marched all night long, going, going through mud holes, up and down hills, through dark roads and over broken bridges. Sometimes we would have to unhitch our horses, and the men would unwillingly pull the guns by hand. Jackson's men are tougher than mules. A little before daybreak, we halted to feed our horses and cook something for ourselves, or else do without on the coming day. Well, we knew it would be impossible to get anything to eat after the battle commenced. The plan of the battle was plain to us at this early stage of combat. The bulk of our infantry would be concentrated in the neighborhood of Fredericksburg, and it would have greatly the advantage of the Federals in position. Between Hamilton's Crossing and the Rappahannock is an extended plain, and we would mass our artillery there to drive back the Federal left wing. General J.E.B. Stewart, our dashing cavalry general, was to command our massed artillery on the right. At a sweeping gallop were these parrot guns taken to their position, and under the gallant Pelham were soon engaged with the enemy. Here, on the extreme right... Our artillerist had not the advantage of an elevated position, but had to fight the enemy in an open field, and more also were not supported by a single regiment of infantry. Though General D. H. Hill, who commanded our line of reserves, kept in reinforcing distance and could easily have rendered them assistance had it been necessary. This artillery was handled with powerful effect upon the enemy, for it entirely protected our right flank and necessarily kept the enemy confined in a much smaller space than his great numbers warranted. If Burnside had turned either flank on Lee's army, and the right was by far the weakest point, we should have been compelled to relinquish our almost impregnable front being, as it was a series of hills extending from Hamilton's crossing to Fredericksburg. The enemy had siege guns planted on the Stafford, the north side of the Rappahannock, and they immediately opened up on our right, so our artillerist had to stand not only the fire of the Federal field batteries, but the siege guns also. Those guns could not be reached, and their fire had to be received without reply. 
As soon as this section of my company had been ordered to General Stewart, the howitzer section, guns number two and four, together with the remaining smoothbore guns of my regiment, were ordered under the brow of a hill near Hamilton's Crossing for protection and were held for close-quarter work, should Burnside press us too heavily. We were in direct line of the enemy's guns, and though not actively engaged, were greatly annoyed by the hot fire poured into us. About the most disagreeable position in the world is to be in the line of fire without being actively engaged. General A.P. Hill, commanding our center, having left a space of nearly half a mile between two of his brigades, came very near causing our front line serious trouble. There was a marsh in our front, and General Hill, supposing it to be impassable, had left it improperly guarded. The Federal General, Franklin, seeing this, made a bold dash for that marsh and succeeded in forcing quite a large body of troops into our line, driving our men back in some confusion and making some captures. Our second line at that point advanced with a shout to meet them, and the contest became worn. Our lines to the right and left closed in, capturing a great number of the Yankees. However, the greater portion of them escaped, carrying with them in their retreat nearly all of the 16th Georgia Regiment. Then our smoothbore guns were ordered to the front, but only two of them were placed in position, as twas useless for us to contend with the Federal guns at long range. Those two that succeeded in getting a position lost several men and five or six horses before they fired a shot. Also, our Lieutenant Colonel Lewis Minor Coleman, who was with them, was mortally wounded. All the while, the battle raged heavily far away on the left, where the heaviest fighting was done, and well we knew brave old Longstreet was winning fresh laurels for our cause. The earth trembled and shook neath the continued roar of cannon, and the very air seemed a sulfurous compound. Meagher's Irish brigade was melting away before those terrible heights of Mayer, and Burnside had found to his cost that Lee's army a veritable stone wall was between him and Richmond. The sharp, shrill rattle of musketry and the peculiar whiz of the mini-ball made the front line a very unpleasant place to slumber in, though several of the boys did go fast asleep whilst the battle was hottest. The smooth bores were ordered back to their former position, and soon afterward our parrot guns came back for more ammunition, and also after more men, for our loss had been heavy. First and foremost... Among them all, gallant, brave, and noble Oots had fallen. Yes, and fallen, where he always was when duty called him, at his post. But a few months since, he was elected from the ranks to the post he has so ably filled, and since that time he has, by his unswerving rectitude of character and manly devotion to our cause as well as to the direct interest of our company, gained a place in the affections of our men such as I have never witnessed before. He was indeed the idol of his company and, without exception, the best officer in his regiment. His loss to the third company will never be replaced. Private Matthews, mortally wounded. George A. Smith, severely wounded in the arm and leg. George Nicholas, mortally wounded. Poor fellow. Only a few moments since Nicholas's father came up to, know, to us to know what of his boy, but he was too late. Matthews was a VMI cadet and had just joined our company. Private Samuel Wakem was also severely wounded. Private Robert R. Roberts made a narrow escape. He had a bullet mold in his pocket, and a mini ball struck it with such a force that a portion of the lead was forced into the mold. Bob was badly shocked, and possibly his feelings were a little hurt. But he is a good natured fellow, he will get over it in a day or so. This section lost a good many horses. Having procured more ammunition and also more men, this section again returned to the field, and this time under the command of Lieutenant W.P. Payne, the only commissioned officer we have with us now. Night had, by this time, in a great measure, lulled the tempest of our battle, but there were still some Yankee sharpshooters on our right who annoyed us greatly, and these guns were sent out to drive them away. By permission, I left my gun and went out with this party under Lieutenant Payne. It was very dark, and we could see nothing save the occasional flash of a gun, could hear nothing save the hurtling of a shell or the whiz of a mini. 
some infantry passing us halted, and they told us that Jackson was preparing for a night attack on Burnside. Indeed, it was currently reported that old Stonewall intended making his men charge in their shirt tails. About nine o'clock, this section under Lieutenant Payne returned, and we then prepared to make ourselves comfortable for the night. All of our blankets and provisions had been left at last night's camp, but after a while, our commissary sergeant sent us something to eat. Little as it was, it proved to be a great help to us and was quickly devoured by the men. Our loss in the regiment was unusually heavy. The Rockbridge artillery, four guns engaged, six men killed and 15 wounded. The second howitzers, three guns engaged, 12 men killed and wounded. Dance's Powhatan artillery, one gun engaged all day and two more for a short time, had only three wounded. Besides this, some 50 regimental horses were disabled. Being in the smooth bore section, the account of what I saw must necessarily be contracted, but this I know, Burnside did not drive Lee away from his impregnable position, and the bulk of Lee's army had not commenced to fight before Burnside was whipped. At the close of the day, we held every inch of our ground and had slain thousands of the enemy, whilst our loss was comparatively nothing. Though we have captured no cannon, nor even a single wagon, we have taken many prisoners, and the morale of Burnside's splendid army has gone, and it will be felt throughout the length and breadth of all Lincolndom. The loss amongst our artillerists has been much greater than any in any previous engagement, but that is easily explained, for it was managed by chiefs of artillery and not infantry brigadiers, and as usually is the case, and for that reason it was the more effective. Heretofore, a battery followed its brigade into a battle and often was subjected to a terrible fire without being able to return it. Some good brigadiers of infantry don't know the difference between reinforce of a gun and a priming wire, and I did hear of one who ordered his battery to open upon the enemy with a three-second solid shot. Today, as a battery was wanted, it was sent out by the chief of artillery who selected such guns as were most useful at the point desired, and the effectiveness of this mode is apparent from our success on the right. Colonel Crutchfield was eminently fitted for this position, and his cool bravery tended greatly towards giving confidence to our men. After the battle, on going into the Rockbridge artillery, I was informed of the death of Baxter McCorkle, lieutenant in that celebrated company, he was an old playmate and a boon companion in my schoolboy days when Rockbridge County was my home. We buried him darkly at dead of night, and we bitterly thought of the morrow. December 14th. We have been anxiously awaiting a renewal of the engagement, but so far Burnside seems satisfied and is not disposed to advance. December 15th. Soon this morning, my company was ordered to take position on the front, and we expected this to be the grand day of the fight. Our rifle guns took their former position on the right, whilst our sh little shell howitzers took position near the center of Jackson's Corps, supported by Dole's Georgia Brigade. As my gun is one of the shell howitzers, and it can shoot about as far as a Churchill boy can sling a rock, I refer more especially to them. On getting near our position, we halted under the brow of a hill so as to be out of view. The plan was this. If the Yankees were to advance, we would run our guns out to the edge of the woods and open upon their infantry, paying no attention to their artillery. And as they had 16 guns directly in front of us, that would be difficult to do. We were put there especially to fight infantry, for their long-range guns would soon get the better of us. What moments of terrible suspense were these? Here were two of the largest bodies of men ever collected together on this continent, confronting each other, just a few hundred yards apart, awaiting the dread signal for the bloody work to begin. Even the skirmishers, almost near enough to touch each other, seemed to have come to a tacit understanding that they would not fight until the grand move was made. It would be folly for us to give up our splendid line of defense and fight the enemy on an open plain, covered in every direction, by their powerful artillery, and to me it seems impossible for Burnside to drive us away. 
About three o'clock in the afternoon, someone near me exclaimed, Here comes a flag of truce. Sure enough, the little white flag is fluttering fitfully on the plain, and the bloody hand is stayed, for Lee has granted Burnside a few hours' respite to bury his dead. I took my position on the brow of a high hill and eagerly watched the movements of both parties. The sight was grand beyond description. Spread out beneath us on an open rolling plain lay the Federal Army, extending as far as the eye could reach. Clad in their blue uniforms with glittering muskets, banners flying, and horses prancing, they marched and countermarched as if passing in some grand review. But for all this, the gray-coated rebels hold the hills, and not all that proud array of countless thousands can dislodge them. Slowly marching across the field, there comes a long column of the enemy, bearing not muskets, but litters to carry off their dead. A column of equal size from our army meets them. They halt. Seemingly, a few words of consultation pass between the leaders. They break into squads of fours, and the work of collecting the wounded and the dead commences. Rapidly do they work, but they have more than they can accomplish by night, and there will be no more fighting today. The Federals do not respect the truce flag, or those of the Stafford side of the river are not advised of its import. Away off on their extreme left, across the Rappahannock, comes the sullen boom of heavy ordnance, and a shell comes whizzing over towards us. Again and again they fire, but without effect. With the aid of a glass, I could plainly see the Yankees throwing up breastworks, notwithstanding the flag of truce. Lee could not have been blamed if he had opened his entire artillery upon them. Night came on, and we quick, quietly dropped back into our trenches to await the issues of tomorrow. We sent our horses back to the rear whilst our men and guns remained in front. As usual, we also sent back a man for our rations, and when they were brought, our hunger was not half appeased. One meal a day, and then not half enough, will not do to fight on. There never has been since the creation of the world an army like ours. Even in the darkest hours of the revolution, our men suffered no more than now. Day after day do we toil on, fighting without food, without raiment, without rest, hoping on, hoping ever. December 16th. About an hour before day, we were aroused by a drenching rain, and I crept under a caisson for protection. When the day fairly broke, we saw that the Yankees, under cover of night, had crossed the river and disappeared, leaving us masters of the field. I rode over the battlefield and procured many things I was sadly in need of. The Yankees had buried or carried off most of their killed, but still many were left on the field. We also captured many prisoners who were unable to keep up with the main body of the army.